Hey Dimitro, how is going? Hi Adam, thanks a lot for uh, invitation. It's uh, I'm uh, doing great. Thanks a lot. How about you? Perfect. And Dimitro is pronounced correctly, or is it? Yeah, yeah, it sounds like that. Sounds, <laughs> sounds like that, but not perfectly, but almost right. Yeah, I mean, in in Ukrainian, it would sound like Dimitro. Dimitro. Uh, yeah, but uh, I can imagine it's hard to pronounce. No, Dimitro. Dimitro. Yeah. Okay. Dimitro. Uh, so there is no uh, Y in between D and M. Dimitro. Ah, Dimitro. Yeah. Dimitro. Dimit- Perfect. Dimitro. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. So, uh, Dimitro. Regardless uh, of my pronunciation skills, what I'm really would like to know is what was your first computer? Oh, I, I if I recall correctly, it was. Uh, I mean, obviously, it was not a laptop. It was a big computer. Yeah. So it was, I think it was Pentium 2. Okay. Um, and later, I think I upgraded to Pentium 3. Okay. Yeah. So Pentium was already late in the game. So what you did, you started to play games. So what was your first interactions with the Pentium? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it, it was in, um, I think, in 1998 or 99. Mm-hmm. So I, I was around six, seven years old. Mm-hmm. Uh, so obviously I was uh, very interested in all, all this new uh, new stuff uh, mm-hmm. came out and yeah I, I played some games it was mostly 2D games at first so mm-hmm. I didn't have um, any internet at first so I just played whatever I, I was able to get uh, or just uh, you know navigating the Windows uh, mm-hmm. going to start menu and looking which programs are there. <laughs> I think it was Windows ninety five or ninety eight. I think right. Yeah, yeah, right. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so you are roughly the same age as I am. I right? So just 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 kidding. <laughs> 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 okay, cool. So um, and and what? Okay, you remember the your first game you really liked back then? The name of the game. I don't remember the game, but uh, I think it was uh, there was some browser game. I think it was Flash, probably. Okay. So uh, on some uh, website, my father uh, went to uh, look at uh, weather forecast, and there was uh, just uh, on the side of the of the web page there was a small game uh, with the bots. I I don't know what's the name, so that was. Something I was playing. <laughs> okay, um, cool. So, uh, and, and and what happened then? So you started in order to play more games, or you switched to programming immediately, or what was you know what you did with the computer back then? I mean, it was a mix. So I uh, I just was interested in 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 this computer, what it what it is like, how it works. So I used to break it a lot uh, at first. So when I navigated the Windows system and deleted some files or whatever. Oh. I didn't like uh, some files in uh, Win32, let's say. Okay. Uh, and uh, I started breaking it quite quite early. And then uh, after a couple of times, it, uh, we had to uh, to ask some person to come and fix it. Uh, he just finally taught me how to reinstall the window, Windows uh, system uh, mm-hmm. by myself. And then um, it was safer. So I could play more and then reinstall and... <laughs> Uh, start from scratch. How often do you reinstall Windows then? Yeah, it was uh, yeah, definitely more than ten times. Ten times, I think. And also the uh, the Windows itself. Uh, sometimes it 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 just broke uh, for no apparent reason. So uh, it was a good skill to have. Mm-hmm. Um, a neighbor asked me once. Uh, he he gets uh, Windows, and I should help him with the installation. It's like no problem. I do it all the time. So we are done in ten minutes. And um, so what uh, what happened is um, he had a problem, an error, but the error appeared maybe for half a second. So it was you know too quick to to spot it. So uh, we tried you know to 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 take a picture and record a movie, but the cameras back then they were so bad, so the resolution was not enough to read it. You know what what is on the screen, and then I got the glorious idea you know to remove all the hardware. So at the end there was nothing. And the arrow still still appeared. So and then I, I think it was like five six hours, you know, journey. And at the end, I, I think we made it work, but I forgot what the root cause was. But these were crazy times. Is why I'm asking, you know, how often you reinstall Windows? Um, yeah, quite often. Okay. <laughs> and what he started to 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 sh- I think uh, batch programming right back then. Um, batch. What do you mean batch? Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. How, how to exec? You know, dot dot bat. 
you know the the ah yeah no actually uh, I I didn't program at that point of time on on computer mm-hmm. so at at some point uh, mobile phones became popular um, so we we got I mean mobile phones in in Ukraine and they um, there were few which were able to run Java um, games. Mm-hmm. And at that point of time, uh, there was also very popular mobile internet, so WAP, it's mm-hmm. called WAP, um, and there was all kinds of uh, you know forums, uh, mm-hmm. online um, exchanges of uh, images, files, games, mm-hmm. uh, ringtones for mobile phones, uh, whatever. And this was something that I was interested in at that point of time, so I started kind of building uh, uh, mobile phones websites. Wow! So and so so you was, so you did. So you were not that interesting in the Pentium. It's just you know you just uh, install Windows several times, and then you know the the true you know uh, how to call it um, interest was sparked by a mobile phone, right? Uh, yeah, I think because I, I mean probably it's also related to to the fact that uh, I, I didn't have much access to the computer itself, so my mm-hmm. parents were quite strict with that. But mobile phone, I had it all, all the time with me, so I, I could uh, do more stuff with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I I started just with programming this. Um, but this is crazy. Website. You started to with programming. So your first program was a mobile one. Um, I mean, it was just a, a XHTML website which you can open on. Yeah, the mobile but still. Phone. So so your first thing was targeted for mobile. Yeah, because it's it was. I I think it was way cheaper and more uh, easier to get. So you are the, my first guest, I think, with this. So you are the you know the mobile native developer. Or mobile first developer. <laughs> Everyone else, you know, started with uh, Pentium servers, whatever, and you are the first with mobile, which is great. Um, yeah, but I, I mean, I didn't uh, mess uh, with uh, native applications. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I remember my first um, kind of uh, memory of Java was a, a Java icon on on the mobile phone when you mm-hmm. launch the game, and mm-hmm. it was uh, like this cup mm-hmm. of coffee with Java ME. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I didn't understand what what is Java at all and uh, all mm-hmm. that stuff. Funny enough, I, I don't think I ever played a Java ME game on a, on a phone. I completely missed that somehow the the gaming experience. I remember I had some companies with ringtones. They were they were huge big back then. Back then, you know, there was a the um, they were they were running application servers to sell ring, ringtones. I also never had a ringtone, a special one. But uh, I, I said, okay, if you need it, we, I can help you. But I took it really seriously with the ringtones. And then uh, WAP, I ignored it a bit because it was terrible. So the um, uh, and J2ME was actually big, but uh, we did some enterprise projects. But I never played a game. I have to admit. And were the plays uh, the games actually good? So, or or I mean, what was it? It was like well, lots of games. I guess right. Java ME game. Yeah, um, I, I would say it was quite popular. Yes. And okay. Also. In um, in our segment of internet on on, on the Ukraine, uh, it it was so, so there was no you know control um, mm-hmm. about it. So everything was free. You could you could go to any website and just download it. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah, and, and were they good games? Good. Really good games, or was it just like I don't know ping yeah. pong or whatever? Yeah, quite quite fun ones. Um, I remember the, the one which which was probably the most popular at that point of time was called uh, Gravity Defied. It's so like uh, with a uh, motorcycle, two D two D game. Gravity, gravity defied. You said, huh? Yeah, gravity mm-hmm. defied. Mm-hmm. I remember. Yeah, the whole school uh, on every <laughs> lesson, everyone was singing, uh, singing and playing uh, this game. Ah, okay. So even worse than now, right? Now everyone uh, uses iPhone or whatever, and back then this was Java ME, so no, no difference. Yeah, and uh, at that time everyone was sharing these uh, images and games via. Uh, infrared ports and Bluetooth, uh, you know, so it was fun time. Ah, infrared. Uh, you could share whether infrared what? Uh, the, the, the game? Everything, or... uh, yeah, with the files. So, so jar file, uh, the game was a jar file. So you could uh, just send it to another uh, mobile phone or And, and did or... the mobile phones and infrared ports? Which yes. mobile phones you had? Nokia or what was it back then? Uh, Nokia, Siemens is... Uh... I forgot about the infrared port, I have to admit. So I also had the Siemens, the, the, I had a... Uh, Ericsson was a nice one, a very thin one, and uh, from Nokia I have the biggest one, which you could open. You know, it was the Navigator, I think, was called, or um, so there was like two pieces you can open. It almost looked like a laptop, but it was a small one, and uh, it also ran Java ME. So I did some, you know, basic programming, but um, yeah, interesting. So um, and and you started to to learn Java then. 
Uh, no, not really. I mean, at that point of time, I, uh, I was just doing this web uh, thingy, so mm-hmm. a- H, uh, XHTML, mm-hmm. uh, some CSS, uh, whatever. Mm-hmm. Then a bit later, uh, it was uh, I, I wanted to make this websites more, you know, interactive uh, with some logic backend. So I started learning PHP and uh, MySQL. Mm-hmm. And which website would you like to build? Um, Right now, or, no. Mean, back back then. then, so you wanted back to build. Back then, it was mm-hmm. back then it was just uh, you know the website with uh, uh, just so w- with some categories like images, games, uh, ringtone. So you could just go there and, and download. You can also have some forum, uh, so you can send messages to other people and uh, receive messages. Let's say, and but but that was not for a long time. Um, and then later on, I somehow. Ended up uh, actually doing uh, not not building these websites, but more like hosting them. So I I created a, uh, so it was also popular thing that you you could buy the um, space in mm-hmm. on, on some uh, server and resell it mm-hmm. for other people to you know to build the, their mm-hmm. website to host it. So I I had this kind of hosting. Cool. So you're a businessman. How how old were you by then? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, it was the uh, end of, of the school, so I was 14, 15. Yeah, wow, so you earned some money with it. Yeah, actually, we. Uh, I, I mean, I ran it also with my friend, uh, my best friend, and uh, we earned quite quite a, a good amount. And then when the school uh, finished and we had to, to, you know, focus on university and stuff, we sold it, and we also cashed quite, quite, quite yeah, a very good, good amount at that point. So that was uh, my kind of my first experience with... Um, and and the backend use Apache server with PHP or what you did? Um, yeah, it was uh, PHP, uh, some CGI scripts and mm-hmm. Python as well. So it, it was. I mean, I, at that point of time, I didn't really understand all of that. Mm-hmm. So I, I just uh, kind of resold it and tried to help. And if there were some issues, I tried to dig in, but not really understood what, mm-hmm. what was going on. And what you studied? Computer science. Um, studied. So I started studying it probably in still in the school so there was uh, some lessons with um, pascal mm-hmm. pascal okay and that's i think the first but uh, but before that i think i i, I started le- learning php before that myself mm-hmm. okay kind of. so i i i more consider myself as self self taught and what, what you uh, at the university which, what what you studied at the university which uh, was it computer science or math um it it was um, metrology so it's a um, science of measurement wow um, so, so, so you st- studied meteorology? Not meteor. Okay, this is a fun one. So, not meteorology, not about the weather, but metrology. This is um, how you measure things. Uh, like ah, okay, how like to measure? And, I, yeah. I, what I think is like it is not about you know the weather rather than meteors. It's like okay, this is even more interesting. But you said you know meteorology, how to measure things? And there is yeah. a study about that. Yeah, uh, it has a lot of uh, mathematics behind it. And, yeah, that's uh, what, I, what, I, what I thought. And why that? You, you wanted to measure or what? I, I mean, this was uh, the, the best uh, option I, I could get in for free to I mean, okay. the university. Okay. Yeah, of course, there, there were some more uh, fancy computer science uh, faculties, but I didn't manage to. I mean, there was a big uh, demand, so I didn't get... Uh, yeah, you, you, you spent too much time you know, earning money. This was your problem, I guess, right? <laughs> <laughs> As your businessman, yeah. yeah. So and uh, in university, uh, first couple of years we didn't really study anything, and then there was some C. Uh, but uh, when I just, I mean, when I finally got really interested in into programming and understood, like, the, yeah, that's that's my thing. That's what I want to do. Uh, was um, uh, where when we started learning assembler and then later Java. So wow. this was um, one uh, teacher, very good one, mm-hmm. very strict one, but very good one. Uh, yeah, so he taught uh, quite. He taught us a lot, uh, good stuff. But mm-hmm. with Java, you started, you know, Java JDK one three, I suppose, right? No, I think it was uh, six. One, wow, one point six. Uh, when I this was two thousand five six around. Right? No, 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 that was already two thousand. Uh, 10, I think. Okay, in, in then, the then it was 6 for sure. Okay. Yeah, 6, and then when I started my first job, it was 7. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, 6 was already, uh, the Java 5 bring us annotations, Java 6 was already 
nice one and java 8 was a really good one right so this was the okay and uh what do you appreciate in java that much so why you like java you remember why you say okay this is cool um i i mean to be honest uh my first um kind of uh First time I, I tried to program in Java, mm -hmm. I didn't really like it. After mm -hmm. a PHP, uh, I got used to all this dynamic stuff, and uh, it, it was way simpler to, to do somehow. Um, and also, I didn't quite uh, right away got this idea of object-oriented programming. Mm -hmm. So I, I had a hard time to wrap my he head around this um, new paradigm mm -hmm. that uh, Java was, um, or Maybe not Java. My teacher was pushing. Uh, so at first, my uh, impression of Java was quite horrible. Yeah, but uh, somehow later, uh, I finally understood all these concepts. And uh, now, I mean, I, it's just uh, kind of a part of me, right? Uh, it's mm -hmm. so intuitive for me. So, it's, uh, so uh, I mean, what 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 I uh, like about it is that uh, yeah, for sure, it's uh, st static. Uh, so it's I mean, you you can you can reason about the programs, right? You can, you can have mm -hmm. some kind of guarantees mm -hmm. um, about that. It's very popular. It has a, a very good community, large mm -hmm. one. And uh, recently, with all these new uh, releases, uh, frequent releases, it became I mean, awesome. Yeah, yeah, stimmt. Uh, stimmt, I say. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. A absolutely. Um, this also it's also my opinion. So um, so we share something here. So what I'm interested in, uh, what was your first job? What you did after university with Java? What you built? Uh, my first job was, uh, so it was outsourcing company. Mm -hmm. I was working uh, remotely for UBS bank. Mm -hmm. um, it was uh, it was just regular enterprise stuff. Mm -hmm. So Spring, uh, Hibernate, uh, Vadin. Mm -hmm for UI and we were building some forex trading uh, and you and you enjoyed that so or you liked that yeah of course i mean it was my first job yeah. i was super excited i learned a lot of stuff there mm -hmm. uh, a lot of good people around so yeah very cool was... and what happened then so you st stick with the company or what is your next job because it's like your first job so i assume there was a second job as well yeah sure i mean i, I at that point of time i i thought yeah, I need to if I if I want to learn a lot, I, I need to move out. So after one year, I left for another company, uh, started uh, working at uh, for some Israeli mm -hmm. company as well. I mean, um, remotely, mm -hmm. uh, and it was also. I mean, the the, the backend was written in C plus plus, and there was a dedicated team for that, and I was working uh, almost alone. I mean, there was one person uh, in my team with Java. So we were building the UI uh, in GWT for, for this. Uh, oh, this, yeah, I didn't like GWT. This was yeah, terrible. Yeah. If yeah. you know, Vadin was a late, way better than GWT. So yes, I never understood. Yes. Yeah, this was a slow and, uh, you know, magic from hell, I would call it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So how, 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 how long you spent, you know, with the GWT? I'm just curious. I think around one and a half years. Okay. Around so, mm -hmm. yeah. So the UBS, I think the UBS part was uh, maybe more exciting than the GWT, right? Um, yes, but uh, I mean, it's it's not only about uh, technologies. It's also, uh, I mean, I learned a lot uh, in in both places, you know. In, okay. With the GWT, the technology was not, not the best one, but the system was much more complicated. And I had to also, I mean, try to mm -hmm. learn how, how, how to work with it and how to make yeah. changes how to properly test and uh, debug and mm -hmm. uh, i mean that was a great time okay so one one and a half so what was next job i'm just curious now you was, should know remain longer and longer so what was your next time next job it, it was actually the same company just a different team so i i I was uh, I, I took a sab sabbatical for a couple of months and then re returned back, and it was the same uh, company. But I, uh, it was already uh, different application, uh, desktop client, mm -hmm. and there was some queues and uh, some. Was Java X or Swing? Uh, I think it was Swing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, there I uh, faced. Quite a lot of issues with uh, multi-threading, with deadlocks, with mm -hmm. some out-of-memory problems. So at that point, I dug uh, deeply into the um, JVM, how it all works, mm -hmm. and uh, all this stuff. So it was also cool. 
and then after that uh, I uh, I traveled at the point of time quite a lot and always wanted to emigrate somewhere mm-hmm. and uh, I've just got back from from USA trip mm-hmm. and wanted to actually emigrate to the USA uh, but when I started preparing for uh, for these interviews uh, and stuff I said okay I, I can do a couple of uh, training rounds interviews with some other companies and there was some lady that wrote me uh, about some opportunities in Germany mm-hmm. and I just went for this just for fun for this interviews just to mm-hmm. take a look like how it all look, looks like um, and when I got, got a couple of offers then I started considering it more seriously mm-hmm. and when I started comparing USA and Germany it became apparent for me that Germany is much more mm-hmm. uh, better. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, fits my lifestyle and my uh, mm-hmm. kind of values. Uh, yeah, th- that's how I emigrated here, and I started working at Wirecard, which ah. uh, mm-hmm. a couple of years ago went bust. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, uh, this is uh, this was very nice experience. I mean, I, I really liked the team. Also, also Java. Wirecard. Also in Java. Yeah, yeah, it was Java. Uh, it was so work at, I was working at payment processing mm-hmm. uh, division, say credit cards and stuff like that. And yeah, I, I worked on multiple mm-hmm. uh, services inside this the whole platform. It was really fun. Mm-hmm. Okay, and you're still with Wirecard right now? Uh, yes, I think it was bought by Santander mm-hmm. uh, Bank. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah, many of uh, people I worked with, they uh, they are still working there and quite happy with it. And you right now? Um, I'm also happy. <laughs> yeah, you are still at, at, at the Santander Bank. Ah, no, 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 no. I, I, when uh, all this uh, happened suddenly, I mean, there was uh, no, no, nobody. There was a chaos. Nobody know, knew mm-hmm. if if the company would survive or not. So, I also started looking at uh, other opportunities, and then I joined Revolut mm-hmm. um, and worked there for a couple of years. Also with Java. Yeah, it was basically the same, the same payment processing system. So I was, since I had the experience with the domain, yeah, it was fine. But yeah, then finally I decided uh, it's, I'm fed up with this domain. I want something completely different. And then I uh, found uh, a company here in Munich. Uh, they do um, it's called bio- biotechnology. So I, I had to study quite a, quite a lot of chemistry and proteomics and all of mm-hmm. that stuff to start uh, but the thing is that at that point of time when when i signed the contract with them i didn't yet knew about chat gpt and all this uh, AI mm-hmm. hi- hype uh, so and the couple of months before starting a job i just uh, was fas- fascinated by chat gpt i started using it uh, you know daily exploring mm-hmm. uh, building some applications with it and uh, at that point of time, it was clear that this is something I'm super excited about. I want, wanted to work with that, not, not you know, with uh, mm-hmm. this company. So, uh, But still, since I signed the contract, I had to join. So mm-hmm. I joined, and uh, a couple of uh, weeks later, I got to... Uh, I mean, the, we started an initiative to, to uh, you know, to introduce some AI into the company. Mm-hmm. So there were, there were some people who uh, were excited about that and knew what can be done already now, how to do that and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So we started doing that. And I kind of switched from the main project to this AI project. Mm-hmm. And we started building some semantic search systems for inter- internal use and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, and in parallel, I was also pushing this uh, LangChain for g Yeah, how you started project. with LangChain? So how how you know what was the first commit and why you did it or what how was what is the motivation? I mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so I would say that um, so when I started with ChatGPT, I, I used it mostly via UI with mm-hmm. a chat interface. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. Uh, soon I realized that I I want to use it somehow from Java, mm-hmm. right? From and and they export the API, so I learned the API I had to how to use it. The HTTP API, I mean, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. right. REST API, mm-hmm. um, kind of, and uh, yeah, I started building some chatbots, some applications uh, with it, but it was quite cumbersome. You you had to you know, juggle a lot of stuff to to make something simple. You you had to do a lot of write mm-hmm. a lot of boilerplate glue code, 
And at that point of time, I learned that there is this LangChain, mm -hmm. Python framework, and Llama index, and all, all of the, the rest. And uh, yeah, but since I'm Java developer, I mean, I, I tried to, to use this Python. I, I, I wrote a couple of <laughs> applications with it, but I mean, it was unnatural for me. I, I wanted yeah. to do to, to have Java and uh, quite soon I understood. I mean, this is quite clear that at some point of time, uh, Java world will uh, need something like that. Yes. And ev every, every language actually. So, and it was strange to me seeing this hype wave in the Python uh, community and complete silence in Java. Yeah. So there was absolutely nothing. And I just, I mean, since I already started writing these applications in Java and looking at what's how LangChain does it, and I, I started seeing these uh, abstractions, how they, uh, how you can, you know, design this stuff and hide, hide the complexity behind this um, abstract APIs. And um, I just started um refactoring my applications and uh, e extracting these components in into into a separate library and then i decided why why not i just publish it and make it open source and let's see where it goes mm -hmm. somehow somehow it um became known yeah thanks uh, thanks to uh, stefan jansen and devox mm -hmm. he uh, noticed this project. I mean, initially it was called not Langchain 4J. I started with AI 4J, mm -hmm. it was called. And uh, then at some point I wrote the, um, the founder of Langchain Python uh, library and asked if he's fine with me to you know use the name and uh, have this kind of mm -hmm. um, affiliation. He said, yes, why not? So I, yeah, that, I, That's great, uh, actually, I have to say. The kudos to the founder of Langchain, right? So, I mean... Yeah, yeah, he's very, he's a nice guy, very op open-minded. Mm -hmm. um, now we have to know to convince him to switch to Java now, right? This is the next... <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, I mean, so far they were focusing on uh, Python and JavaScript, mm -hmm. but I think they also start realizing that it's not... I mean, this something like that should should be usable also for other languages, so... Mm -hmm. But I, I, I can imagine they don't have enough people for that. Mm -hmm. You are the link chain for J. Uh, used your, your GitHub name is link chain for J, right? Um, yeah, I think I. Yeah, because you are the most active. Uh, just to took a look at what happens on the link chains. Like there is some a guy called link chain for J is crazy active. So um, yeah. Um, so what are the core abstractions? So I, I mean. So why nothing happened? So as ChatGPT came out, so I did the same as you did. Say so, okay. Uh, how to interact with that, right? So, and uh, I created my small library called uh, JGPT, and uh, and what I did, I used uh, string templates, HTTP Java 11 client, and was done. I would say in two hours, I have something running, and then I just you no know, reused that, and it worked good enough for me. So I didn't saw the need to have more than this, but maybe um, I didn't. For instance, I didn't have to integrate with. A vector databases, right? So this was a difference. Right. So if you start, you know, with yeah. the embeddings, I think this is the complexity starts because you have to parse, you know, the the prompt. But I mean, the prompt and assistant and home and everything. So for me, it was uh, the matter of uh, maybe hours, um, and it worked good enough. So okay, job done, right? So the question now is, um, which what abstractions do you have within the lang chain for J? So so what what you can do? Um, okay, so. Uh... The, the the most basic one is uh, language model, right? Mm -hmm. This is uh, just an interface which uh, uh, there is uh, dozens of uh, integrations with OpenAI, with Olama, with uh, Gemini, whatever. Bedrock, even AWS, I saw it. Uh, so I, yes. I, I yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, this one is uh, just, uh, you know, string in, string out, and you don't have to. Because all of them, many of them have different uh, APIs, mm -hmm. and but they are similar somehow, want... right? So di different but yeah. similar. So yeah, yeah, they are similar, and actually these implementations are very thin, thin wrappers uh, mm -hmm. around. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but the thing is that uh, there are so many models, and they uh, come out uh, so fast that you want uh, to have this kind of flexibility to switch one to another. If some new stuff comes out, mm -hmm. you want just to switch easily, and this is how you can do it. Uh, so you wrote all you, the extensions? Uh, no, I would so say a couple of first ones, the most uh, mm -hmm. used ones. 
and uh, the community then um, contributors helped uh, okay, with a good. lot mm-hmm. with mm-hmm. other. Mm-hmm. So I, I I try to focus now more on core functionality, and mm-hmm. a lot of people are happy to contribute. The so the 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 the, uh, the how to call it smallest building block or the most simplest one. Is the exp- uh, extract um, abstraction from uh, from the language model itself? You, you said it's mm-hmm. uh, system in system out, so very similar to console, like system in system out, something like this. So you you write something to the chat to the language model, and you get an answer back, back right? Yeah. Okay. Right. Mm-hmm. And and, and the added values already you want to know that uh, you know all the how to parse and all the information or how to how to prompt because usually you have the assistant and you have the user. And uh, there are small things like in Bedrock, you have to know to have a new line and the other ones not. So already here you save, you know, hours, right? So if you're working with several models. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, that is the sim- simplest one. But then later uh, the, they came up with the chat API, mm-hmm. which is currently the most used one and probably will uh, stay. So ChatGPT, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, they introduce this. Uh, first and uh, now you need to juggle multiple messages if you mm-hmm. so since this uh, uh, model behind was fine tuned to have a conversation chat like mm-hmm. experience then you have a bunch of messages uh, that you need to manage mm-hmm. and this is also if 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 you want to keep track of the so if if l so LLM itself it's stateless, mm-hmm. right? So you uh, you have to send the whole conversation again and again on each interaction. Mm-hmm. So for example, if you don't want to deal with that and uh, think yourself how how you I mean store where to store these messages, how to uh, drop them because at at some point of time they will not fit into the context window. So you you mm-hmm. should have kind of eviction uh, mm-hmm. strategies there. Mm-hmm. It. So what are you so, saying? Yes, uh, because it's stateless, I will have to to pack more and more in the prompt. Whatever was answered, I have to you know to provide all the information and then you know ask or or something in addition to it. But the context window is small, depends on the model, and uh, at one point of time we get not out of memory, but rather than out of uh, tokens, out, uh, <laughs> tokens, tokens, out of tokens, uh, out of tokens error yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, right, so yeah, and, and that's the, the simplest one. So from from templating, I mean, this is just uh, simple stuff, right? You you can mm-hmm. you can do it yourself manually. That's fine. Uh, but uh, yeah, when when you get to this uh, more complex patterns like uh, rag retrieval augmented generation, if you want to kind of yeah, wait a second, the first thing you have the solution to like a working memory, right? So it remembers what 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 uh, what the answer was, and then it just yeah. is able, you know, to send it again, right? So this is. Uh, yes. the the first the next edit value right so we had the the chat and then we have something like conversation memory right or whatever how how you call it in Blink for J it's it's called chat memory chat memory so there's the chat yeah. memory not uh, chat memory so this is already a bigger edit edit value because now we can now we uh, the Java remembers on the client side what uh, client side what what was the uh, conversation it's like a HTTP session back then right similar. And and kind of, uh, and yes. then it's able to send you know the data to the chat. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and you can so basically it's just a wrapper around the list of messages, mm-hmm. but uh, it has this uh, added functionality that you can persist mm-hmm. it easily. You can also define the strategy when to evict the messages. So you can say, okay, I have a budget of uh, I don't know two thousand tokens, mm-hmm. and this is a maximum I I can. Uh, mm-hmm. I can accept, and if uh, the messages will not, if some messages will not fit into this uh, mm-hmm. budget, they just got dropped. And the system message, which is kind of a very important one, where you define how mm-hmm. how the uh, assistant should behave, how it should answer, it also kind of stays on top and it never gets dropped. So this is already bigger added value because uh, to implement it by yourself is lots of fiddling, you know, which is dropped and and testing, and this is. Obviously, something which uh, you don't have to re-implement over and over again. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, but those are kind of low-level bil- building blocks. So we expose them mm-hmm. as interfaces, and user uh, users are free to use them. Mm-hmm. But of course, even even using that, it's still kind of cumbersome, and you want uh, a bit of higher-level mm-hmm. uh, abstractions. So, what is the next That's... abstraction? What uses the the chat memory? 
Uh, so uh, the one which we came up with uh, called is called AI service. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is um, so similar idea to um, to retrofit or uh, Spring Data GPA, mm-hmm. where you as a user you define the interface the API, how you want to communicate with a with model. Mm-hmm. So inputs and outputs, how the inputs got uh, you know, translated uh, to the prompt, mm-hmm. how user input is, gets translated to the prompt, and how the output of the LM gets then parsed back. Yeah. This is what, what it does at, at base. So you basically define the interface with a method. Mm-hmm. You say, what are the arguments? Mm-hmm. It can be as simple as a just string. If it is a just a simple uh, input from the user, and the output, uh, the simplest one is string, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but let's say you want to to have the outputs to be structured. Mm-hmm. You want not a string, not a text, but you want some fields. You you, you have some uh, Java Bojo, mm-hmm. and you want to get it back. Mm-hmm. So the 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 only thing you need to do is just to to change the string return type to this Bojo, mm-hmm. and that's it. And then the um, instruction to the LLM how it should uh, output the um, mm-hmm. the content is handled under under the hood by this AI. But this service. is more complex because you have to know what to tell the AI in order to get proper JSON, right? So uh, right, yeah, you can use the reflection for the. I mean, we'll, no, no, we'll but uh, for instance, in uh, you know, in um, in um, Claude is for instance uh, easier to use uh, or XML to say you know. In this XML, put the answer in this XML. This XML is uh, better supported. In ChatGPT, you can say, okay, uh, um, answer in JSON, and this comes on the end. So what, I, what I'm saying is, you, this is almost like Hibernate, right? Because you have to know, uh, or JPA, you have to know, you know what to tell the model in order to get you know, the proper result back, right? Because you will have to parse the string at the end. So this is, will be the job of the AI service, right? Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. So this is what is done, uh, I mean, the functionality is quite basic right now. Uh, it was first designed for ChatGPT, obviously, but uh, it seems to work fine with uh, the rest of the models okay, as cool. well. Mm-hmm. And later on, uh, we will also introduce more and more, you know, uh, model-specific things. So, okay. for example, in this case, ChatGPT, uh, even without JSON mode, it can give you a quite good, nice, nicely formatted JSON. Mm-hmm. So you don't really have to worry about this. Uh, but for Llama, for example, or for whatever other model, you will have to, to use some more advanced prompt techniques. Or, or mm-hmm. if if the uh, model runtime allows it to use some, uh, for example, grammar sampling that you, you can enforce uh, the model to return the JSON. Mm-hmm. So this is something uh, we will be adding more and more. So you will need something like a model profile and depend yeah. in right so depending on the model it will use different techniques to tell the model what to get back this is okay yeah mm-hmm. at least for the most popular yeah. ones yeah, yeah. Those mm-hmm. which people use but this could be a part of the um, uh, integrations uh, you know where you have lots of the plugins uh, the, the, the the basic one you have mm-hmm. the system in system out and this one could also complain uh, complain con- uh, contain some uh, instructions how to serialize POJOs back and forth. So the part of the plugin would be, you know, how to, uh, oh, interesting challenge, you know, what to tell to the model to get proper JSON back, right? So uh, exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cool. Yeah, exactly. So AI service is like um, interface with annotations and the annotations are the basic abstractions. So you have input, output, and um, and uh, uh, what happens, the interface is uh, implemented on the fly. And you can inject the interface. I'm using Quarkus, for instance, to Quarkus. And uh, what uh, what's interesting is this is link chain. If I saw you know, the chat memory, I immediately thought about CDI scopes. It's like, this is great because it's like conversation scope. Back then, we had even the annotations, right? So you could use mm-hmm. uh, the entire Quarkus micro profile and even natively compile the everything to GraalVM, which is crazy. So uh, yeah. why am I so excited? Because all of my pro- projects right now are more or less in serverless. So with that, I could actually create an AWS Lambda, which works on Quarkus, you know, use the link chain, completely uh, create a native uh, native image and have a, a serverless gate gateway to most of the language models, which is actually very, very useful. Yeah, I mean, that's that's cool, yeah. No, uh, cool, this is uh, really important because... Um, why it's so important? Because... Um, 
So why this length chain project is so so important is um, lots of companies, and you mentioned already some that they have you know enterprise stacks running in the backends. So in my world is often no micro profile or Java E based or Jakarta E based something like this, and uh, because of the market pressure, the question is how to integrate with large language models for different reasons. You know proof of concepts chatbots, uh, rule engines, uh, stuff like that. And uh, and uh, they have already, you know, Java is full stack. We have the Java CI, CD, everything is Java. Now the question is how to do that. And uh, with LangChain, and uh, even better, if you have Corcus, there is nothing to do. We install the extension and we use LangChain behind the scenes and we can use exactly the same programming model as the remaining application without any changes. And this is seamlessly integrated, you know. This is the added value. It's not like it's not possible without, but in enterprise environments, you know the best, right? So it has to be somehow compliant with the architecture. And, and this is actually a really important project. Yeah, that's what we, I mean, striving to do, uh, make it as, as easy to possible mm-hmm. to use. Mm-hmm. So to to get the, your first LLM response, you just add single Maven dependency, mm-hmm. create a single object, and call a method, and now you you have the response from mm-hmm. the model. Mm-hmm. And even if you don't have the uh, API keys, for example, for ChatGPT, you want to try it. You, you you can even use a demo key which we provide for free, mm-hmm. because we understand that no, no, not everyone wants to you know share their credit card details and all of that stuff. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's what we. I, the initial I mean idea was to democratize the use of uh, mm-hmm. AI and sim- simplify it basically for Java developers. Uh, yeah. And for you, can, it can become, you know, uh, a main project, something commercial again, right? Um, yeah, I mean, at, uh, right now it's my main project. So I I, oh, mm-hmm. I, re- I resigned from the job because, I I mean, after DevOps, I, I've seen there some mm-hmm. uh, interest in it and uh, the potential. So I decided to, to risk a bit and uh, just resigned and uh, start focusing on, on this project mm-hmm. fully. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I mean, I, I don't think about commercializing. Uh, I mean, I think it's... It will happen. And... So if, if this added value will happen, and even, you know, uh, if you provide your consulting services, it is also interesting that you can, you know, uh, focus on this, what you like, right? So and this is the, this is a uh, huge value. And uh, also in my case, for instance, this podcast, I say, okay, it is just fun. <laughs> Who knows what happens, right? So uh, there is no, just, you know, have a fun with interesting people. So um, yeah, for now, I just... Mm-hmm. For now, I just you know uh, enjoy building it, uh, improving it, and mm-hmm. this is uh, fun, really fun. AI service. So, but I assume you have also some you know in, uh, integration with Rack. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, both uh, low level components which you can mm-hmm. kind of use and mix as you want. What, what are the low level components in LangChain? So, if you want to do rec, uh, what what is usually uh, done? So, you have some kind of knowledge base. Mm-hmm. Uh, first, you, you you want to connect that to to the LM somehow. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can search this knowledge base in different ways, right? So there were even before that there, there were elastic search, whatever key, keyword key, keyword search. So, you you could ex- um, retrieve the information, the relevant one. Um, the let's say. If the user asks some question and uh, you have some information about that in your documentation, let's say, uh, you want to pick that piece of documentation and inject it into the prompt so that LLM has access to it and can answer the question from the user based on Mm -hmm. that information. Uh, So you could do that with Elasticsearch, but lately what became popular uh, this is this so-called semantic search where you convert documents into basically compressed documents in, into the vectors of yeah, numbers. But, but Elasticsearch was more or less like string search, right? It was not semantic. It, it was more like, yeah. you know, uh, maybe you no know, similar words, but was not really semantic. So it is not a true, yeah. true competitor to, to rank, right? Right. But it's still yeah. information yeah, yeah, sure. mm-hmm. methods. Not that advanced, but yeah. And yeah, so basically you need uh, some way to represent these documents in the semantic space. So mm-hmm. you, you need embedding model for that. Mm-hmm. OpenAI provides one. Uh, and embedding is just a, l- a number, right? So it's like a multidimensional vector. It's, yeah, it's it's multi. It's just basically a list of uh, uh, floats, mm-hmm. let's say. Mm-hmm. And then uh, 
if you have uh, if you, so if you embed two uh, pieces of text which are very similar mm -hmm. they will have a very similar vectors mm -hmm. in this multi-dimensional mm -hmm. space so and the benefit of it is that um, if uh, if you have some question from the user which is kind of similar to something that is already stored in in these vectors mm -hmm. then you can make a vector out of the user question and and then search all the relevant pieces which you already have in your vector store mm -hmm. so you this is a vector is like a placeholder for piece of text and uh if you get a question the database will give you the nearest vectors which are more similar one and the cool store is not only text it can be images or whatever you have right and yeah. um and um and i think the killer feature for enterprise is that with that you can retrieve something from your own database and uh, it means there is a hallucination doesn't matter anymore because you get uh, the you you see you now the uh, the AI chosen this piece of code or the piece of information and the piece of information belongs from your database. Maybe it is not the right one, but you know the the information is no hallucination. So true in, true information. So you are misusing the AI just to match a prompt to your knowledge base, right? So this would be my my interpretation of that. Yeah, kind of. You you are trying to just. Uh, give access to the language model to whatever mm -hmm. relevant information you you have mm -hmm. uh, in your possession. Yeah, so if you want to implement track, you first need a way to import your knowledge base mm -hmm. somehow, process it in a way that uh, is easily digestible by the LLM. Mm -hmm. So usually it's split into smaller pieces like paragraphs. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you need to embed that. So you need embedding models. This is another abstraction. And then you get embedding back. Mm -hmm. This is a vector. And then you need to store it somewhere so that later on you, you could search it. And this is what's called, what we call embedding store. Mm -hmm. And it can be, uh, so currently we have around 15 or even more uh, integrations with different uh, embedding stores. Mm -hmm. Some of them are they call themselves native uh, vector stores. Um, so they were designed initially for, for this purpose. And some uh, of integrations we have uh, established uh, stores like Elasticsearch, for example, or Redis, which added uh, mm -hmm. this vector search functionality. This is one for for Postgres, I think, as well, right? So Yeah, yeah. PG vector. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, Mongo. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. it seems that everyone is adding of course. this uh, yeah. <laughs> feature. Yeah, and it's nice. I mean, if if you if you don't need uh, a lot of uh, I mean, native features, uh, and you're fine with that, why not? And yeah, so that's uh, that's uh, this four building blocks which you need. And uh, Langchain 4J provides a lot of implementations of this uh, building blocks. So for document loaders, we have multiple, which can uh, load and parse in into the model which we have internally in Langchain, like documents and text segments. Then for embedding models, we also have a dozen of integrations. So document loaders, they are already uh, splitting the document with the overlap and everything, right? Or just, just loading the, the, the... Not yet. I mean, they are just loading the document from whatever source. Mm -hmm. They parse it. Uh, so if it's PDF, let's say, okay. uh, it should parse the text uh, somehow, and uh, the, the whole PDF document will be represented as a document mm -hmm. object which contains text inside and some metadata, mm -hmm. like where this uh, document came from, who is the author, the modification date, whatever sites, and so on. So I wondered, actually, we cannot do this, what OpenA OpenAI and the others are doing, because they understand the PDF as well. So they have to have a front-end translation services, whatever, which, you know, t uh, they, they, they read the PDFs and create text and pass it to the backends, right? So because the AI, I mean, they... they they, they cannot just understand the PDF. There, 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 there has to be a translation process in between. Um, or even, I don't know, but I mean, they couldn't, they could maybe understand an image with text, but I don't yeah. think they support, you know, all, all the data formats. This is impossible. Even, I mean, so that, you know, if you send a document and they train the AI to parse uh, Word, I don't think that's how it's working. So in the front end services, maybe they, uh, they have like, uh, extractors right which extract the text mm -hmm. from word from pdf from whatever you have this is my interpretation be interesting to know what they are actually doing mm -hmm. yeah uh, yeah definitely they can i mean the, this new vision models they can mm -hmm. interpret images uh, so if pdf is just an image it can mm -hmm. actually read it mm -hmm. 
but I imagine it's not the most efficient yeah, uh, way exactly. to do that. So they probably have something. Yeah, and there, there, there are some uh, companies and startups which are focusing on that, how to you know parse unstructured data mm-hmm. into a structured format, like unstructured. And uh, I, I, I think something like that should also, I mean, happen in in Java world. Yeah. Um, so you load this is just you know they are they're able to understand the different uh, data from so they are creating from from a document a text an ASCII right yeah piece of text yeah and then you can process it so you can uh, mm-hmm. if if it's HTML for example uh, mm-hmm. document then you can extract the, only the body let's say if you want uh, mm-hmm. just strip out all the f- footers headers and whatever. And uh, then uh, you split this. So usually you split these documents because uh, the problem with embeddings is that the more text you put inside, mm-hmm. so it, it at the end it gets compressed into the single vector. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't matter it is one word mm-hmm. or it is a whole book. Mm-hmm. It gets um, packaged, packaged in, into one single vector. Mm-hmm. And the problem is the more information you embed, the more information you lose. Mm-hmm. Because it kind of averages the mm-hmm. semantics of every, every sentence of every page of, of the book. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is the first problem. Second one is that uh, usually what is the, la- the, the the right size? You have any you know findings? So if you played with this empirically, uh, what what I've seen works quite well is around three hundred tokens. So around okay. three, three, three four hundred words mm-hmm. seems to work fine. But again, it de- depends a lot on on yeah. the information, on the format everything and yeah we also work on on you know the uh, algorithms to come up with some kind of universal splitter that would uh, mm-hmm. take into account both uh, the semantics of the text the formatting of the text mm-hmm. and also we'll try to optimize in a way that mm, not a lot of information is lost during this compression yeah and you need so, also some overlap right also an empirical yeah it, it it also depends. I mean, there are lots of mm-hmm. yeah. So this is all comes down to evaluations, uh, and this is uh, uh, link chain is supported this, uh, right now. Or they are working on it. Yeah, they support it. We we don't yet, and this is something I cool. uh, I'm looking at right now. And uh, yeah, we want to make it very easy for Java developers also to mm-hmm. uh, to evaluate how their system works, how their retrieval works, mm-hmm. how the whole system works, if it's good or not, if they are going into the right direction or not. Mm-hmm. Uh, how they can improve that, yeah. So you could have a JDBC loader, right? Which reads our tables and, uh, you know, as well. Yeah, yeah. in theory, you can import uh, text from whatever. Because then you need a reverse index, like, you know, embeddings to primary key, and then you could retrieve your data from somewhere, right? Yeah, this is uh, as well supported. So Mm -hmm. usually in embedding stores, they store both vector and the text. Mm -hmm. But we can also imagine that uh, some enterprise already has tables with uh, mm-hmm. text like products, for example. Exactly. And you, you can just map 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 by ID. Mm-hmm. So this is uh, supported as well. Yeah. So all, all this process, like how how you load these documents, how you split them, embed them, and store, and then search. Mm-hmm. Uh, you you can in theory you can go and uh, play with these uh, low level components. But we also kind of wrap it in, into high-level thingy, which you don't uh, really need to, to do much and uh, ha- have a simpler interface. And we plan also to simplify it even even more that for default use cases, you don't even need to think about how to you know, split the documents, which embedding model to, to use and so mm-hmm. on. And this embedding model, we, we also support a lot. Uh, so OpenAI uh, is the most popular one, but also, yeah, mm-hmm. uh, it's it's actually not the best one. So you, you can get even better embeddings for free running with local models. Mm-hmm. So there are a couple of uh, leaderboards, one on Hugging Face. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's called MTEB. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you can just uh, look at uh, this leaderboard of different embedding models, how they uh, perform on different tasks. Mm-hmm. Uh, regarding back to the to the vector databases, any pure Java databases you 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 found or are just native ones? I don't really remember. I think Milvus is one which is Java and JVector. Sure. I think JVector is also one from so Cassandra. Probably, yeah. Because uh, yeah. why I'm asking is because you know if Lang LangChain uh, is uh, just pure Java and we get a Java vector database, we don't need 
Docker, right? So it could run everything natively in one memory space without loading anything with Docker container, or whatever. So it would be even more appealing. So this is why I'm interested yeah. in knowing full stack Java because, uh, yeah. Yeah, we have also in memory uh, implementation of embedding store. Wow. I mean, there mm -hmm. is no magic. It's it's just uh, you store these vectors in uh, some data structure and then you just brute force search it. Yeah, this is this uh, is okay, but uh, you know the calculation of the vector is a big deal, right? Yeah, calculation. You mean the embedding. creation of vector yeah. embedding mm -hmm. store? Yeah, creation is uh, also can be done in pure Java right now. Mm -hmm. So we have a couple of popular models, um, mm -hmm. which are just basically uh, Maven dependency you added. Mm -hmm. Which one? You know it? Um, it's uh, all. Uh, mini LM okay. version 6 mm -hmm. and uh, E5 small from Microsoft mm -hmm. and some BG, the new newer ones uh, mm -hmm. they were added lately. Mm -hmm. So yeah, to embed the text you don't really need to even uh, mm -hmm. do external calls to any services you can do it completely in Java mm -hmm. uh, with ONNX runtime yep. and it's it's quite fast actually. You it's said Onyx, Onyx runtime you said? Yeah. Okay. So it's like mm -hmm. The model is 25 megabytes, mm -hmm. so you, you, you just basically uh, run it in your GVM, let's say. This was yeah, on my next question, because what I already saw that uh, you can, with uh, Vector API in Java, read Onyx models, which is uh, also the next step, you know, because then uh, you can get rid of Python, to my knowledge. You could just directly interact with Onyx, which is like the model inter interchange format, and this will yeah. be uh, the next uh, the next adventure, right? Yeah, so that's what we did. We we took the model from uh, Python's uh, safe tensors format and uh, converted it to ONNX, embedded into it into the jar file, mm -hmm. and uh, just ONNX dependency. This is how and and you and you read this Onyx from Java? Yeah, from jar file, from just. Uh, wow, and and who interprets the model? Uh, I mean, I I wrote some bindings around that to to you know. With, uh, yeah, you, you, you are crazy, actually. And... This is uh, this is uh, way better than expected, you know, with uh, length chain. But what you did right now, this is uh, uh, this is a true added value, I would say. So, yeah. And you used the, the, the modern uh, vector API in Java? No? Uh, not yet, but I think this is something that will be very useful here, of course. I mean, current implementation is very inefficient. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Really... But it, what matters yeah. is it is working, you know, so that it, yeah. it is working and, and you can That's... iterate. And it's, it's, this is the most important thing, you know, to, to, to make the integration running and then make it faster. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, I mean, at that point of time, it was crazy for me. Like, you just call the Java method uh, with a text and you get back vector. And it's all happening inside your JVM, so to say. This is so huge, you, you, you don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, many people don't really, I mean, they, they just got to use, you know, OpenAI API and, and that's fine. But Yeah, but this is many, this, this is also what I do in Malaysia. But if you are working, you know, in enterprise projects, Sometimes you don't even have an internet, you know. If you run in a private cloud, you cannot just call whatever. So the more happens locally, the better it is. And um, yeah, exactly. And I think you know models like Olama will also get you know uh, the their own time, even if they are not as good as as uh, ChatGPT four, but they are sometimes good enough for REC. You know, you don't need yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. You don't have you know the Oracle which predicts you know the future. You need something which matches you know your the, the prompt with already existing knowledge, and this is good enough for enterprise, I would say. Yeah, and and this embedding models, this embedding is actually very versatile, and having this uh, ability to do it on the fly uh, or completely offline is really huge. So let's yeah. say you can categorize data, you can classify as a user intent. Like, like yeah. let's say the, the question from the user comes, and you want to know is it a question, mm -hmm. is it maybe a complaint or something yeah. else. So you can instead of using the LLM to interpret that, mm -hmm. you can already do do this decision offline without any latency, mm -hmm. basically. So this is really crazy. And what I think is also, you know, with the length chains that we get uh, smaller models, more appealing, you don't need to know the um, billions of parameter model. We need something more specific just to, 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 to work well with this table, right? Not not the entire world. And uh, yeah. then it makes the uh, performance better and memory consumption and energy consumption better. And, and it's cheaper then. Because yep. in the cloud, you will pay, you know, for CPU cycles, basically, indirectly, right? So this is what you pay for. 
So this is crazy. So did, did, okay, I didn't expect it that you went that far. So okay, because you know, just using Langchain to call HTTP, I was like, this is simple. You know, this is fun. But this is uh, this is serious work you did with, with the Onyx and 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 understanding what's going on. And I mean, you have to read. You know, you have to try an error. I don't know how much time you spent, but I assume several days. You know, to understand what's going on, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, trying to understand how these models work internally mm-hmm. and how to parse, how mm-hmm. to do pooling of these embeddings and uh, but this was actually very fun so mm-hmm. I, I also recommend everyone to <laughs> who's curious uh, to look into yeah that. okay but uh, in the next weekend is around the corner so if you has nothing to do try to parse onyx and you know report back to Dmit- dimitro right <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um now that that's cool so um we have uh this is more interesting to expect and maybe last question for today is the um it's called i don't know how it's called i think it's called functions so that the model can you Call you back, and I think you also support yeah. it. This is called tooling, right? Uh, tooling tools. Tools. Yes. Yeah, we, we, we call it tools uh, mm-hmm. or fu- function calling. Yeah, that's also crazy. Crazy thing. The, uh, the OpenAI was the first who mm-hmm. uh, innovated there and implemented this. So basically, the idea is that uh, with each request to the LLM, mm-hmm. uh, together with the text, with the with the messages, you can give the LLM access to the tools mm-hmm. declaratively. So you can say, okay. You have a couple of tools in your position. You have a, let's say, calculator mm-hmm. and a web browser. Mm-hmm. So if you will decide uh, that to answer the question from the user or his ask, mm-hmm. you need to use some kind of tool. You can you can choose between these two, mm-hmm. and then the model is fine tuned uh, the way that it, it can automatically detect when it really needs to call the tool and and call it. Mm-hmm. And what we do under the hood, so we automatically handle it. So as uh, as an API for the Java developer, he can just define whatever method he wants. He can annotate it as a, with an annotation tool. And then LLM will automatically know that it can call this method. You can add some description, what this method is doing. And you are you creating do open API behind the scenes, right? I guess. Kind of, yeah. Mm-hmm. So uh, automatically all the... Um, Argument types are um, serialized, and uh, so this is uh, a part of, of the request to the LLM. And then you can do whatever you want with this method, right? You can call some API, you can do some calculation, or you can go to the database, you can mm-hmm. trigger some action, you can do whatever you want. And this is very powerful. Mm-hmm. So we, we have an example with a customer support chatbot of uh, imaginary rent, car rental company. Mm-hmm. And it has access to two tools. One is to look up the booking details. Mm -hmm. So the user provides a name and surname and booking number. And uh, then just goes to the database and fetches the information about the booking. Mm -hmm. And it can cancel this booking if the uh, policy allows it. And when the LLM knows about these two tools, and you give it a role, like you you are customer support chatbot, uh, you, you have access to these tools, uh, then it can if if user comes and asks to cancel the booking, it can it can do that. Mm-hmm. So it can just just call this method and that's it. Mm-hmm. And to to make it available uh, as a Java developer, you just basically annotate this method with a tool and that's it. Mm-hmm. So this is a very powerful. But uh, in, then Langchain has to have expose an HTTP endpoint or something so that the uh, open. No no no. Uh, the model. Uh, Responds back with a message, with a specific kind of message, mm-hmm. which contains information, which contains this uh, tool invocation request. Mm-hmm. So it says, "Okay, uh, now instead of answering with a text, I want to call this tool with such parameters, mm-hmm. with such inputs." Mm-hmm. And then uh, under the hood, we parse it, uh, we invoke the method, and we ah. give back the response. Uh-huh. And then the model can interpret this response and then give, a, you know. Uh, natural mm-hmm. answer, like let's say uh, the booking has has been successfully cancelled, whatever, and then this gets back to the user. So this is something user doesn't see. Uh, this is back and forth with tool calling. It's uh, handled completely under the hood of this. But this this is different. Answers. What I thought, what uh, Open um, AI can also do, they can generate Python functions, you know, on demand. Uh, for calculations, this is. This is yeah, I think this, this is. is this is this because this uh, they call it there, but this is even more interesting. So what happens there is the uh, this model say, okay, I would like to call this external tool with these parameters, and you call it 
and and you yeah. get the answer back and then you call the model again i guess right with your yes. answer yes yeah but uh, the one which you mentioned about the dynamic code execution mm-hmm. is exactly. also supported we call it dynamic tools so basically the model is instructed to uh, generate the code mm-hmm. in let's say python or javascript whatever is mm-hmm. you know smaller and sim- simpler yeah. uh, and then we have a couple of um, so we can use graal vm uh, the uh, super polyglot, cool polyglot uh, very cool stuff mm-hmm. so to invoke this thingy but this is quite dangerous, right? It's yeah. running in, yeah. inside the sandbox, but still. Uh, and then there is another service which is remote, so you can send. Uh, it's called, I think, it's hosted on Rapid API. So you, basically, you, you send um, mm-hmm. uh, code as a text, mm-hmm. and uh, it gets uh, compiled, executed, and there is a response you get back. It. Uh, the the Graal VM idea is also huge. So actually, this yeah. is a super interesting language. Uh, this I, I saw the, the I was at the DevOps. And and I t- took a look, you know, and Langchain. So this is cool, but for me it was uh, li- more like enterprise service bus, maybe you know. So it's hexagonal architecture. So I'm in the middle. Lo- uh, the, the 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 models are around me, and I can call everything. Everything is super. But the work you did with Onyx, I think this is a huge one. And you, with the uh, with uh, the uh, tools and dynamic tools with GraalVM, also a big one. And that we can everything you know uh, compile in a native image with uh, Quarkus, for instance, even bigger one. Because now we got integration to private clouds and serverless clouds, which is actually this where you know the interesting stuff happened. So um pretty cool. So um it is going to be too long, but I have to reinvite you back, you know, because uh, what I would like to know, uh, if you if you have time, you know, to, to chat with you sure, about Onyx, you know, Onyx and, and promote the idea a little bit. Uh and uh and uh it is maybe about your progress because um yeah, with yet yeah, I I predict your project will be huge, you know, and uh, the the problem you will get is, you know, to to deny the offers for various companies to buy you, you know. <laughs> this is this is the next problem you get. So and uh, then, uh, John. Let's see. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So far, it's very fun. Where people yeah. can find you? So you have a Twitter, LinkedIn, whatever you have. You can also send me, you know, uh, an email with the links. I will add them to the show notes. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's uh, mostly on Twitter, uh, LangChain for the handle. Mm-hmm. I don't have a personal one yet. You have created uh, one in Blue or... Sky. Blue Sky is also nice. Java um, uh, Java community is forming there. So Blue, oh, Sky, okay. mm-hmm. Blue Sky is like, you know, the founders of Twitter left Twitter and they are Blue Sky now. And uh, Stefan and Devox, they are also Blue Sky, everyone. Bsky.app. Mm-hmm. Okay, thanks. Mm-hmm. Didn't know about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, and on GitHub, there is. I mean, if you want to contact personally on GitHub, there is a link to my LinkedIn. Mm-hmm. So you can also reach me there. Perfect. Was a fun to chat with you. Yeah, thanks a lot for invitation. Really fun discussion. Thanks a lot.